What is going on, gunfighters? Welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gunfighting the right way with God at the center, Judeo Christian values, and real world first hand experience. First and foremost, I am a Christian. I am a servant of God, a follower of Jesus Christ. God is number one and the center of my life. And this podcast is no different. I don't apologize for that. Getting into more about me is to how it pertains to today's topic. Today, we're going to be talking about maritime guns. This is a subject I don't think I've seen brought up much. But we're going to talk about it today. So stay tuned. I'm not going to plug in the regular bio because most of that doesn't indicate whether or not that had anything to do with a maritime environment. So I didn't want to do that whole bio and then add in all the other stuff that would take a long time. You guys probably don't want to listen to five minutes of me rambling on about my experiences. So let's get into the bio. Grew up in the southeastern mid-Atlantic United States. Talking about a maritime environment on a peninsula, the Delmarva Peninsula. Split three ways between Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. It's a peninsula very narrowly connected at the top and out in the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake Bay on the other side. So you were never very far from the water. My father was a commercial fisherman which meant that one of my first jobs was a commercial fisherman out on the water, mostly helping my father. Actually, exclusively helping my father. I decided I did not want to go that route, but my father, a commercial fisherman. His father, a commercial fisherman. So I spent many days on ships out in the ocean or in the Chesapeake Bay, depending on what what we were going for, what my father was fishing for. A lot of shark, but also croaker. Hardhead, if you know what those are in the season, in the bay. The Chesapeake, that is. I still know how nice it is after being on a ship out in the ocean to put your feet on terra firma, on dry land. As you might imagine, we had guns on the boat. I hardly remember my father going anywhere without his... Ruger Red Hawk and 44 Magnum, or Super Red Hawk 44 Magnum. Moving on, I was also a lifeguard for quite a while. Now, as you know, if you listen to the normal bio, I joined the Marine Corps at 17. And you might think Marine Corps, that's all kinds of Marine. I mean, it's in the name. Well, I was pretty much in two places in the Marine Corps, and that was 29 Palms, which is in the middle of the Mojave Desert, and Iraq. So, not really. I don't think I ever stepped foot on a naval vessel in my years in the United States Marine Corps. There was a time when the Marine Corps was like a small maritime fighting force attached to naval vessels. But anymore, it seems like they're more like a small army of elite fighters. Which... You know that I also served in the U.S. Army, if you listen to the normal bio, but I was stationed in Idaho and in Nevada. My time on LAPD, I was, my main beat was Venice Beach. So if you consider working Venice Beach and LAPD a maritime environment, well, there you go. I did, not on Venice Beach, but I did once get into a foot pursuit where the suspect had a warrant and jumped into the river and did not think that I would jump in after him. (laughs) Little did he know that I did jump in after him in full kit and ended up apprehending him. But other than that, I'm working Venice Beach, you know, getting in, you know, Donnie Brooks hand-to-hand combat on the beach, things like that. It wasn't much of a maritime environment. Anyway, you heard about my service in the military and in law enforcement. If you want to thank me for that service, consider scrolling down and hitting some stars on Spotify or writing a review, hitting some stars on 
iTunes, or whatever platform you're listening, if they allow those kind of things, you want to thank me for my service, you just hit some stars, I'd appreciate it. Or write a review if you want. Hey, good podcast, appreciate the info, and thanks for your service. Also, my private contracting work really was about as far away from a maritime maritime environment as you can get. Like I said, in the Marine Corps, ironically, I was a desert warfare and urban warfare instructor. So a lot of this harkens back to my days I mentioned as a boy. I would go hunting quite a bit. And the unique thing about the Delmarva Peninsula, well, not unique in that it's the only place it happens, but unique in that it's not found in a lot of other environments. In that Delmarva Peninsula, you have freshwater swamps, cypress swamps, rivers, and you have saltwater marshes, giant swaths of land that are tidal saltwater marshes. You also have bay and ocean, and I spent time in all those, not to mention the islands off the coast. Did a lot of hunting and fishing. Did quite a bit of time even as a boy armed. Spent a lot of time on, like I said, my father's commercial fishing vessels. And also on little piddly crafts that me and my friend would get together. I remember one of the friends of the family at one point had a paddle boat. And I don't, don't know how he got the paddle boat. Probably some kind of barter deal or somebody didn't want it. He had made a rudder for it out of some old street sign and a piece of pipe. And it it worked. We fished out of it. I don't know that I ever hunted out of a paddle boat, but that would be pretty cool. Also, the first first vehicle I ever owned was not a car. It was an old crappy canoe with, I believe, four holes in it that I bought and patched up with a fiberglass repair kit. And I spent countless hours in that canoe with a gun and in other canoes hunting and fishing and doing all manner of things like that. If you listen to the other podcast, you'll know much more about the bio, but since today's about maritime guns, let's get into the day's topic. You know, a large portion of not only the U.S., but the world population lives within a fairly close range from the coast or some other major body of water. There's a reason humans settled near those areas for trade, for resources, for water to drink. So many cities today are still in those areas. We've branched out from there once we got better at hydraulic engineering and things, and we have, you know, Phoenix and Las Vegas and these giant metropolitan areas out in the desert. But for the map, But for the vast majority, live near the coast or a body of water or river. Not only that, but I don't know when you listen to this, but it's summer here. It's July. So a lot of people go to the water and have recreation on the water in the summer. Likewise, myself, if you don't know, I recently stepped down from a general manager job because I wasn't giving the podcast the attention to detail or the time I thought it should get and decided to bug out early as it were and to live off grid. Now we lived in the deserts of Arizona. Living in the desert of Arizona off grid in the summertime, pretty miserable. I could do it, but there was a better option. We packed everything up like modern day pioneers and hit an Oregon trail of sorts and headed to Oregon we are now on the Oregon coast which is probably why I was thinking about this topic today everything seems to be wet here we are on the coast just a few miles inland right now but in an environment where right now I'm in the rainforest A very strange environment that I'm not accustomed to where you can be in a rainforest and looking at the ocean or be on the beach and looking into the rainforest. Water everywhere. Anyway, where was I? This environment presents some unique challenges to firearms. Both environments. The fundamental problem. Guns are made of metal. Every gun that I'm aware of has at least some portion made of steel. Steel is made of iron. The fundamental fact about iron, iron rusts. 
Iron rusts faster and more in maritime environments. Now it's oxygen that makes iron rust, but the way that it interacts with water, especially salt water, makes it very much more likely to rust. I said I was living in Arizona. You can really kind of be neglectful of your guns in Arizona and they're probably not going to rust. But in a maritime environment, they rust very quickly. Now, we realized this a long time ago in relation to guns. Now, one of the very first attempts that I'm aware of to stop firearms from rusting is what's called bluing. Now, I'm not a metallurgist. I'm not a chemist. Bluing is a chemical process to finish the outside layer of the firearm, make it less susceptible to rust. It is much better than just plain metal, but it was really our first big mass attempt that I'm aware of to stop steel from rusting. And in my opinion, it is probably your last choice. Now, if that's all you have, that's fine. But blued steel, by and large, is not great at prohibiting rust. It rusts quite easily and quite frequently. It requires attention. It requires a lot of, what's the term, TLC as it were, to keep it from rusting in a lot of maritime, especially in saltwater environments. A story I'll tell you, one of the guns that my father had, they would often let me use to shoot birds when I was on ship, was a Ruger 1022. And one day he told me to clean it. I was young, I don't remember, but this is one of, one of my earliest memories. And the first time I can remember my father being really mad at me. And I thought that I had cleaned it, but I don't know how long it had been, but he went and grabbed it and there was rust on the barrel. And it was obviously wintertime because I remember him getting furious and throwing it in a snowbank because he was so mad at me that I had not cleaned it properly. And what that meant in this case is I hadn't properly oiled the outside of the barrel because it was blued steel, Ruger 1022, the classic one you think of, the wood stock and just a blued steel. And it had rusted. And now my nephew, who still lives in that Delmarva Peninsula, he recently said that he was going to trade or something and get a different gun other than his Ruger 1022. I forget exactly how the conversation went. But it started something like, you know, I want stainless because my nitride finish is rusting. And I said, what are you talking about? And he mentioned it was his Ruger 1022. And I'm like, I love my nephew. He's a good kid, Eagle Scout. But I said, man, that's that's not nitride. That's bluing. They are completely different. And they may look the same, which is maybe what confused him. You know, a lot. he's into the tactical guns and all that stuff. And watching videos, everybody now talks about nitride, nitride, nitride. And if you looked at them side by side, unless you really knew, they look very similar. But nitride is a completely different process and from what I understand, is quite good at corrosion resistance. But your classic blued hunting firearms are just that. They are blued, and they are not nitrided. Your 1022s, your old shotguns, your things like that, they are blued. They are not nitride. So when you hear nitride, that's a fairly new, maybe not a new process as far as metallurgy goes, but it's fairly new that it's common on firearms, and it's almost exclusively that I'm aware of anyway on tactical firearms, your ARs and in that realm. But as far as I know and from my experience, the weapons that I have, nitride is quite good at resisting the elements, uh, resisting rust and corrosion. Now the problems with or maybe problems is too harsh. The lack of ability of bluing to deal with these environments has been known for a long time. That's why back in the day, you had, even back in the old west days, you had nickel plating, seen as a more premium finish. You don't see it much anymore, but we'll touch on it. Just briefly, and take off again. The other real early one that I'm aware of, we used in the military, and this is going back decades and decades, and that's manganese phosphate. And you'll notice this is different than bluing. Bluing tends to be a shiny finish. Manganese phosphate 
tends to be a very black, matted, dull finish. Now, manganese phosphate is not a bad choice. The military adopted it. Obviously, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps. So that would be good in a variety of environments, including maritime environments. And as I believe, the mil-spec, military specification for AR-15 bolt carrier groups, is still manganese phosphate. And this was around before the next thing we're going to talk about, which is probably my favorite. If you listen for any length of time, you know that I'm a fan of stainless guns. I'm a big fan of stainless guns, perhaps because I grew up in this environment. Even when I lived in the desert, as you could tell from my current situation, I'm kind of a nomad. I joined the Marine Corps at 17 and have been bouncing around. I could be wrong. I'd have to plot it on a bunch of maps, but I believe I've been to all 50 states except for two. Needless to say, I've been in a lot of different environments. My God is with me wherever I go. But in a variety of different environments, stainless does well. Now, you might think, well, stainless steel has been around a long time, but stainless steel guns have not. And that's because I'm not a metallurgist. Again, I'm not a chemist. I'm not a machinist. But as I understand it, it took quite a while. They didn't really become common and that I'm aware of. Well, not even common. They didn't become into regular use stainless steel common guns like 1911s, bolt guns, and things like that until the 80s. Somebody might correct me on that, but a lot of guns that came out like the Auto Mag, Ruger's bolt guns, and things like that came around this time, 80s, 90s. And I believe that's because... Stainless have been around a while, and guns have obviously been around a long time, but getting a stainless steel with the right properties, the right hardness, the right ability to withstand pressures, and be machined and play nicely with other metals took a while. But now we do have that, and I like it. In fact, I almost always, if I have the option for stainless, will get stainless. The only exception I could think of is if I just wanted a classic, beautiful, looking blued steel walnut stock gun like an over and under shotgun or a side by side because back when these guns were common again if it's a classic that's what was around not a gun collector but by god's grace i will never have to sell my grandfather's shotgun and we'll get to pass that down which is an old side by side ah fox this was a hard use working man's duck hunting tool blued steel and i presume walnut who knows what kind of wood it is cherry or something it kind of looks like cherry It's an A.H. Fox, I believe well over 100 years old, still works. Blue steel, I have no idea how many times it's been rusted over and repolished and browned and weathered. It still works. I had to kind of manufacture new springs for it. Anyway, getting back on topic, I would get one because it was classic looking if I wanted a classic gun. I'm not a gun collector. This is gunfighter life. And there's nobody that can make an argument to me that blue guns are better in a variety of environments than stainless steel guns. I did hear when I was a professional hunter and guide, a lot of the old timers said that you couldn't use a stainless gun because it was too visible. And I kind of call nonsense on that. Never mind, maybe they're thinking of the old polished nickel, but modern stainless steel guns are a matte finish. And in my opinion... That gray stands out less than black. Black stands out pretty well in a natural environment. Is what blue steel guns generally look like. And they're generally shiny. So again, I kind of call nonsense on that. If you do have a stainless, a true stainless steel gun that is shiny, just take some steel wool or something to it, some kind of abrasive, and it won't be shiny anymore. But I think for a variety of environments, and especially maritime environments, stainless steel is my favorite choice. Now... Stainless steel on a firearm will and can still rust if it's neglected or not taken care of. But it's a lot more forgiving of that neglect than a blued steel gun. Meaning, like, you have a lot more time to not oil it, not maintain it, or a lot more time it can be out in the elements without rusting than a blued steel gun. Ruger is kind of known for their stainless steel, have been for a long time. They made a lot of what they called their all-weather models, at least when I was growing up. And I said, mentioned my father, his Ruger 44 Mag stainless steel. 
Now, he liked 44 Mag, which Ruger is also known for, and he liked stainless steel likely because he was a commercial fisherman, a sailor. A good combination. We'll talk about one more finish, then we'll move into something hopefully a little bit more specific as to actual firearms. Make some models that are great. Chrome lining. There are many reasons the military, the mil spec for a lot of things, is chrome lined. Chrome is a super hard, super impervious to a lot of things component. I'm not aware of any chrome gun like where the external is chrome, but chrome lined barrels, chrome lined chambers, that's a big, big help in a lot of environments, maritime being one. That is a good segue to the first guns we're going to talk about. Not because they're the best guns for a maritime environment, but because they are arguably the most commonly owned firearm in America, at least as a category, a class. And that's going to be your AR-15 type, M4 clone type firearms. Your modern sporting rifle, your assault rifle, your weapon of war. Yeah, those guns. The guns that are probably more commonly owned by most Americans than any other. Obviously, the military uses them. Obviously, unlike me, there are still Marines that operate in maritime environments and do landings and are part of amphibious assaults, at least in training. And until those guns get supposedly replaced by the M5, they do that role and have done it for decades. So obviously, they're decent at it, especially if they're maintained properly. Now, as I said, this is a very common gun category. But not all ARs are created equal. There are a lot of fantastic, I mean fantastic, affordable, affordable is a relative term, but decently good value priced ARs on the market that function well. And the way they're affordable is they tend to cut things that you don't really need. If you're talking about a maritime gun, to me, this is not the place to go cheap on an AR. It is not. The things we talked about hitherto for in this episode, things like a chrome-lined barrel that your military spec ARs should have, and your very high-end ARs should have, that's really going to help you in a maritime environment. Not only does... Steel corrode quickly in a saltwater environment. Brass can corrode fairly quickly. And having a chrome-lined chamber can really help with extraction of those nasty cases. Chrome, again, chrome is very impervious to a lot of things. Heat, the elements. I would absolutely, if I was getting an AR for a maritime environment, if I could, I would get a chrome-lined barrel for this. We mentioned nitride, which is becoming common. I don't know if nitride is as good as chrome lined. It's fairly new in this world, at least new as far as I am aware of it. And as I understand it, there are a lot of different things that call themselves nitride. Some of them very good at corrosion resistance in my experience, but I don't know if they all are. I know that chrome lined stuff is good. So again, this is not where I would go cheap. I would do my research and really, really, really get a good finish. Hopefully a chrome-lined barrel. This is not the kind of environment where you want a blued budget AR with a blued bolt carrier group. We talked about the military specification for the bolt being manganese phosphate, and that's a good choice, but I think there are better ones. Chrome line being the obvious choice. We talked about how nice it is to have a chrome lined. And I like chrome lined in my fighting rifles for a lot of different environments. But especially, especially for a maritime environment. And the manganese phosphate is okay, but I think a chrome lined bolt, which you can get, which are not ridiculously unaffordable, a chrome lined bolt, or even a what they call tin titanium nitride, I believe would be a better choice for this. So upgrading to that and your functional parts. On a mil spec firing pin, I have never ever seen one of those with rust. 
I'm sure that it could happen, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. Where I would see it is your little tiny parts and your springs, so make sure that those are premium parts. And if there's a way to upgrade those to something that doesn't rust like, this might be the... Maybe you want to upgrade to your titanium pins or things like that. Also mags, polymer, you don't have to worry about, and P mags are great. The Amen 2s are probably my, my favorite brand of AR mag. Any of those would be great and great choices. And you're likely going to have to worry far more about the ammo in those going bad before the mags going bad. I know the steel is obviously what makes the spring in those mags, but it doesn't really touch anything that's on your gun. And that magazine spring would have to get pretty rusty before it wouldn't function. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But again, your premium parts, and most of us, let's face it, are running optics. I'd say if you're trying to do this of a reliable gun, get a good quality components like we talked about. And if you can't afford a really good optic, just stick with iron sights. Iron sights work. It's the reason the military used them for so long. I'd rather have a good solid set of iron sights than a crappy Amazon optic that was half full of water. Like I was trying to look through a sauna. If you're going to go optics on this, you know, I... I'm all I understand growing up poor I grew up very poor. I understand being on a budget, but like I said if it were me I would choose good quality mil spec iron sights, maybe stepping back a bit in technology and holding there until you can afford a good robust optic. If you are going to put a cheaper optic on there, make sure you got QD, some kind of QD quick detach so if it does go bad you just rip it off and throw it away and you're back to your iron. This you absolutely if you're going to put a cheaper optic on this firearm absolutely good backup iron sights again not the 29.99 ones you saw on amazon good robust backup iron sights you're talking about a you know shooting competition which i didn't mention in the bio but i've done quite a bit of yeah a cheap optic is going to do you better than iron sights but in a maritime environment, survival, hunting, defense situation, good quality irons are going to be better than a cheap optic, I believe. Especially for being able to count on it and being reliable. Obviously, the really good optics are rated for this, and they'll do just fine. Your trigicons, your aim points, and things like that. But they're spending. They might end up costing you as much as a rifle. And again, I don't think the AR is the ultimate maritime gun. There is one... I believe that stands out and I do believe that the shotgun if you've listened we did a whole we do a whole series here on shotguns the ultimate and most versatile survival weapon apocalypse weapon whatever you want to call it also one of the best for a lot of situations maritime guns and I think for combat shotguns semi-auto is where it's at that is the best however for a maritime shotgun, I think pump action is where it's at. Because you can put a lot of force on a pump, and a pump shotgun would have to get pretty corroded before you could not manually cycle it and function it, at least to break it open the first time. You should never let your guns get that nasty and dirty. But if they did, I think a pump shotgun in a nasty environment with a lot of corrosion would run longer than a semi-auto. And you still get a good reasonable rate of fire. Obviously, you don't get a long range with these firearms. If you're talking about survival, maybe your bug out plan is to hop on your, your bug out vehicle, you know, as a houseboat or a sailboat. I'd say that's kind of a genius idea. Provided you already know how to sail and things like that. It's like being good with a firearm. You don't just expect to get your CCW permit and go out and be good the day you get in a gunfight. You need to be good now. And then when it happens, you're already good because that's not the time to learn. If you're planning to hunt for food during the apocalypse, you better know how to hunt now. Likewise, if your plan is to get on a sailboat, hopefully you know how to sail well now. Navigate, navigate primitive ways without a GPS by the stars and whatnot now. I'd say that's a good choice. And I'd say we have examples of that. Let's not get too crazy apocalyptic water world, but let's look at pirates. Now, pirates did this for a living. They raided other ships. So that's kind of... One of the Marines' original purposes was to go from one ship to another ship and plunder it, destroy it, raid it, sink it, scuttle it, whatever. Talking way back before there were engines on ships. 
The Marine Corps was founded long before there were engines on ships. Unless I'm wrong and somebody put a crazy steam engine on a warship back in the 1700s. But anyway, I digress. What did the pirates do? They had big ship-to-ship guns, cannons, what you would call a proper gun. Even modern naval vessels, they have like 16-inch guns and giant guns like that. More so today, guided missiles and aircraft launched from ships. But when it comes ship-to-ship, which is probably what you're going to deal with, you're talking close quarters combat. And one of the kings of that is the shotgun. It's like our land-loving counterparts. A lot of harbor police and maritime and coast guard, they use shotguns. And they use them for a reason because they're effective at close range. Now, we should also mention that shotguns, especially the pump shotgun, is kind of originally designed as a hardcore, hard environment hunting implement. It's a every man's tool for taking all kinds of game. And they're designed to function in these kind of environments. You know, duck hunting is about as nasty an environment as you're going to put a gun through. And pump shotguns are meant to run in those. Obviously, there are some specialty models to be even better at this. A classic one, which I do not believe is currently made anymore, I could be wrong, is the 870 Mariner. It's got that whatever stainless steel, I don't know if it's a stainless steel finish or a chrome finish, whatever it is. It's known as the Mariner. It's used for maritime law enforcement. It would be a good choice if you could find one and they still make it. I do know that Benelli, I have seen they also make similar models in their shotguns. And I do believe the new Turkish manufacturers, who I should mention on a lot of their guns, are really, really good even on their budget guns of chrome lining the barrels. For this environment is huge. And I believe that some of those also have maritime models. So if you're looking for a maritime gun on a budget, there you go. Just like our end of the world as we know it on land, end of the world as we know it by sea, especially in our smaller vessels, which is probably what you would end up on. The shotgun is great. Again, they're meant for putting food on the table, even in maritime environments. Yes, you can fish with a shotgun, provided the fish are close to the surface. Again, obey all your local laws, but if you were starving to death, that would be a thing. Also, quintessential, you know, waterfowl hunting, duck hunting, goose hunting, things like that on the water. Pump shotgun is your tool. You could probably even, without a lot of engineering effort and background, figure out a way to have a 12-gauge pump shotgun fire a harpoon that you made. That's the reason shotguns are good in a lot of different environments, is that they are so versatile. Oh, a big thing for this, they also make flare and signaling rounds for a shotgun. We often think about the tactical situations of being super sneaky, sniper, ghillie suit, never being seen. But a lot of times you want to be found. And a lot of survival situations out of sea, you want to be found. And a shotgun that gives you defensive capabilities, food procurement capabilities, and that also gives you signaling capabilities. That's a big thing. That's a big advantage. And again, they make those signal rounds for shotguns. Now, this is a brief aside, but a shotgun I love when they were around and they don't make them anymore, but I said Ruger was kind of known for their stainless. They made a Ruger red label in stainless steel over and under shotgun. That would be an awesome gun to own. I don't know that I ever would. They're kind of a collector's thing now. Again, I'm not a gun collector. If I was able, by God's grace, to acquire one in some kind of barter deal or something like that, that would be fantastic. But they did make them. They do exist. Also, for this, I should mention that there are different shotguns with different receiver materials. Obviously, aluminum does not rust. So, this may be a case where you are trying to decide between two shotguns. One has an aluminum receiver and one has a steel receiver. I actually, in general, like the recoil. I believe I can feel the difference in recoil, and I think I like the recoil better on a steel receiver shotgun. Call me crazy. But this is a situation where I'd probably want the aluminum. Why? Because aluminum doesn't rust, and even if the bolt inside there, yes, there's a bolt and a shotgun, at least in a pump-action shotgun. Even if that got a little rust on it, at least you're not getting rust in the receiver and rust on the bolt, and those getting rusted together, that aluminum would help that. Because, again, aluminum does not rust. Now, we are going to get off the shotgun and go to the handgun, but before I do, I want to go back, reverse... And talk about a few other rifles. Again, I would say stainless steel. If you don't want semi-auto, if you want something manually operated like a pump, but in a rifle, a big bore lever action would not be a bad choice. 
or even a pistol caliber lever action. Something like a 44 mag stainless steel lever action, which do exist, or a 357 magnum lever action, which do exist. A 4570 lever action in stainless steel would be a decent choice. You know, if you're talking about maritime small craft in Alaska, a lot of Alaska, especially a lot of Alaska where people live, is maritime. It's on the coast. It is a rainforest, especially the southern peninsula that hangs down. I've never been there, but as I understand, it is a rainforest. Just a colder, probably dimmer version of the rainforest I'm here in Oregon. But it is a maritime environment. A lever action 4570 for that or similar, you know, 454 Casul, 444 Marlin, which is an awesome caliber, anything like that. A manually operated stainless steel gun would be a decent choice for this. So we talked about the AR. Now the AK. And when I say AK, I mean that whole family genre of clones. There are some really good bulletproof, like Russian, Bulgarian AKs. Or even super fancy quasi Sig Sauer AKs. It runs the gambit. So I'm talking about that whole family. You think about the AK as your quintessential rugged, reliable, semi-automatic anyway, firearm. And I would submit, yes, comma, if you have a good one. If you get the dirt cheapest one made to the dirt cheapest bidder with the lowest quality parts and the lowest quality finish, it's probably still going to rust. And it may or may not work when it rusts. Just like we talked about the AR, the importance of that chrome-lined barrel. A good quality chrome-lined AK barrel. A good quality military finish. Not some crappy finish made to the lowest bidder by a cheap importer. I'm talking a really good quality finish. And I am not a metallurgist when it comes to American military firearms finishes, let alone Soviet super-secret KGB AK firearm finishes. I don't know what kind of finish they use. I know that if it's an actual military spec AK from a good, reputable country that made them, again, Russia, Bulgarians really have a good reputation, any legit country that made them as an actual military gun and got decommissioned and got sent over here like that with all those good quality components, probably good. One made to be dirt cheap to the cheapest bidder that was never a military gun, even though it's you know, in that AK family, might not be the best choice. So I guess I would conclude that by saying all AKs are not created equal. And I said we'd talk about handguns, so let's get to it. Handguns. We talked about chrome-lined barrels. They do make chrome-lined barreled handguns. There are a few. The only mass-produced common one that I'm aware of, and by common I mean it's, it's, most people would know what it is is the Beretta 92. Now your Beretta 92 M9 has a chrome-lined barrel. That is fantastic. I've said, and I do not apologize for my opinion and belief, that the Beretta 92 is quite possibly the world's finest combat handgun. I know, I know, I know, everybody thinks it's got to be a Glock or something, but I think there are a lot of inherent design advantages on the Beretta 92. Much more than what we're going to talk about here, which is it's got an aluminum lower, which doesn't rust. They have a very good finish, that Brunton or however you pronounce it finish. And they have a chrome-lined barrel. What other common handgun do you know that has a chrome-lined barrel? Now, I don't want any rust on my barrel, but if I'm going to choose, I would much rather have a lot of rust on the outside of my barrel and no rust on the inside of my barrel than vice versa or even a little bit of rust on the inside of the barrel. Rust on the outside of the barrel should not affect the way the gun shoots at all which is kind of the point of a gun is how good it shoots or doesn't shoot or function or doesn't function not how pretty it looks unless again you're a collector which this is not gun collector life. I really like the Beretta 92 mostly for its operating system and its smoothness of action and its accuracy But also, we see it shine here where it has a chrome-lined barrel. And again, it's not the only one, but as far as I'm aware, it's the only common one. And yes, I will get to Glocks. Glocks are a good choice. I don't... There have been several 
different iterations of Glock finishes. The old Tenefer finish, which I'm not exactly sure how that is or is not a nitride or similar to or different. Again, I'm not a metallurgist. If anybody out there is and knows way more about this and like does this for a living, uh, contact me. I'd love to have you on the show and nerd out about gun steals and gun finishes. But the Tenefer on Glocks... I'm sure it exists, but I have never seen a rusty Glock slide. And I've seen a lot of Glocks. Again, I was a police officer. I'm an FBI certified firearms instructor. I've taught the vast majority of people with Glocks. I'm sure somebody somewhere dropped the Glock in a porter potty and found it five years later. Or one was in a safe in Katrina and got rusty. But what I'm saying is that finish is not a blued finish. Whatever Tenefer, whatever, you know, process they use for that finish is really good at inhibiting and keeping the elements out. And obviously, the big claim to fame for Glock, they're plastic. Not only can you not find them on a metal detector, that's a joke for people who are around in the 80s. But plastic doesn't really have a problem with maritime environments. So for all you Glock fanboys out there, what I will say is that a cheap upgrade, you know, Glock shoot underwater. Cool, but you need the Maritime Spring Cups. They're a few dollars. Take the Maritime Spring Cups, put them in your gun if you're going to be in a maritime environment. They just allow the water to get out of the firing pin channel. Just like anything hydraulic, that's not going to compress if you have water in there and let the firing pin go forward if it's full of water. So those Maritime Spring Cups have little recesses that let the water escape. They're a few dollars. I believe they're made out of Teflon. It's a quick, easy, cheap upgrade. So there you go. Probably should have saved that for the tactical tip of the day. Oh, well, you get it for free. In fact, if you're not a patron, you pretty much get all this for free as far as money goes. Good segue. If you thought this episode was worth a dollar, consider going to GoodShepherdTraining.com, supporting on Patreon. Moving on, Glocks, Maritime Spring Cups, good to go. Other classic choices, we talked about, you know, your quintessential coastal Alaskan environment, things like that, or even your East Coast environment. Let's look at the wisdom of my father. Like I said, he almost never went places without his stainless steel 44 mag Ruger Red Hawk or Super Red Hawk. A stainless steel revolver has a lot of advantages. I would say that a blued steel revolver does not. But a stainless steel revolver that's a good choice one caveat to that the springs inside the revolver are probably not stainless so if it gets completely submerged and wet you're going to have to take stuff off of that to dry it out and clean it out and lubricate it which is going to be a pain in the butt far harder than on say a glock where the parts are simple and fairly big and come apart fairly easily so if you completely submerge the revolver it might not work out too well unless you have a lot of brake cleaner. You're probably going to have to disassemble that thing. And if you've ever disassembled a revolver, not fun and not really easy to do in the field. But a good stainless steel revolver that you don't completely submerge in the water, that's a good choice. Another big benefit to that is unless you get a partial squib where the round goes out of the forcing cone and into the barrel and locks up the gun, in which case you just have a stainless steel club now, Other than that, if the ammo doesn't work, you just pull the trigger again and it will fire, which if you get ammo wet is likely to happen. Which is another good segue into another part of this podcast, which is ammo selection for maritime environments. Some is better than others. Now often I kind of crap on using military ammo for civilians, but this is a place where you might want to do that. This is a place where you might want that. A round that's not as good ballistically, but actually fires, is better than an awesome, well-designed hollow point that doesn't go out the end of your barrel because the powder got wet. A lot of military specification NATO spec ammo, pistol or AR, is required to be packaged in a way. If you're going to store it to help with water, your classic ammo can. And... A couple of other things, they'll usually use some kind of sealant, especially around the primer. If your primer and powder gets wet, that round is just a hunk of metal now. 
a lot of this, you'll look at the back of your ammo, whether it's military, U.S. military surplus or like Soviet surplus. It'll have some kind of sealant, red, green, even your civilian or law enforcement, like premium defensive loads, like my Winchester Ranger T, it has this red sealant around the primer. That helps keep moisture out of there. Moisture, oil, anything like that, it helps keep out of the powder, which obviously I shouldn't have to explain why is important. So this might be a place where you want the cheaper mil spec ammo, or you want to step up to a premium defensive load in your handgun that has these features. We're already at 40 something, over 40 minutes into this podcast. I was planning on talking about all manner of lubricants and things like that. I probably won't. I'll touch briefly on different kinds when we talk about this finishing part of this podcast which is going to be storage. We talked about ammo cans. Ammo cans are your cheapest, best way to keep moisture out in a maritime environment of your storage ammo. Obviously not your go-to ammo, but your storage ammo. Your military spec, there's probably some cheap knockoffs, but your military spec ammo cans, assuming they're not damaged, are very good at keeping out moisture. They're made for that. If they're not sealed when you get them and you're putting stuff in there, a good cheap tip is those hand warmers. Take a hand warmer, shake it up briefly, throw it in there and shut it. The way those work, if you don't know, they get warm by turning iron into rust. And that takes oxygen. That removes that oxygen and moisture from that container. Think of it as a large, cheap oxygen absorber. I'll just say... You know, the Russians, if you've ever bought an old Russian surplus gun, Cosmoline, how gross it is and nasty it is, and it's kind of a joke in the U.S. firearms community. Cosmoline is a thing for a reason. If you're storing guns long term, that really does help inhibit rust and things like that. So Cosmoline or something like it, some thick, nasty grease that's not going to get hot run off and leave your gun is something to think about if you're storing guns in a maritime environment. Obviously, you don't want that on your carry gun, the gun on your hip. But if you have a couple of guns, say you have a gun for hunting season in a maritime environment, and it's going to be a couple of months until you're allowed to hunt with it again, maybe putting some of that thicker, nastier grease, I don't care, lithium grease, you know, petroleum grease, axle grease, anything like that on there, and coating it in a way that's going to inhibit that rust, that corrosion is a good thing. Don't get it in your small parts and your small pieces so that the gun actually won't function because there's so much stuff in there. For your small parts and small pieces, I'd recommend some REM oil, spraying it in there, your trigger mechanisms, and so forth. All right, let's start transitioning to conclude this episode. If you like this podcast, if you thought it was worth the fraction of the cost of a box of ammo, please consider going to goodshepherdtraining.com and clicking on Patreon. If you think, you know what, I'm going to be a pirate in the apocalypse, and this episode has really convinced me, changed my life, certainly worth the cost of a box of ammo, again, please consider goodshepherdtraining.com and going to Patreon. If you're thinking, I'm not going to do that, but you want to be part of a cool tribe of dudes, of men, not just me, but a group of men we have on the Patreon chat, you can do that by becoming a patron, if for no other reason than that. And it's not just me giving advice on there, it's us helping each other on there to be, number one, better men, and number two, just talking about cool gun stuff, cool knife stuff, life stuff with a group of like-minded men that you can have a virtual tribe and connection with. If you want that, again, consider becoming a patron. I'll put a Patreon link in the show notes. As a thanks for listening to all that, I'm going to give you the tactical tip of the day. We talked about maritime environments, which obviously means water, but not all water is created equal. 
Your tactical tip of the day, fresh water. Don't think that water on a gun is always bad. If you, for whatever reason, get salt water, seawater, you know, salt marsh water on your gun, it's probably a very good idea to clean that gun, rinse that gun in clean water. If you can, hot soapy water, but if not, at least clean, fresh water. Obviously, let it dry if you can before you reassemble it or anything, but far better to get your gun wet twice after it got wet with salt water, rinsing it off with clean running water than just letting it dry and leave it there with the salt water on it. Salt water is notoriously corrosive on guns and hard on guns. So clean water and again hot soapy running water on a salt water infused gun. It's a good way to clean a gun in any environment. Hot soapy water, an old toothbrush or something. Especially a gun that's really filthy. Letting it dry and then putting whatever kind of lubricant you want on it. Obviously, the key to this, let it dry before you reassemble it. A tactical tip inside of the tactical tip. If you have access to it, that cheap canned air stuff or something like it. You get towards the end of your bottles of like spray lubricant. Where it's mostly just air. Using things like that. Or brake cleaner or rubbing alcohol. If it's not going to hurt the finish to displace that water and get it out of there. Any of those things. Get the water out of the small moving parts. Your AR lower. Your firing pin channel. And your take your pick of semi-automatic handguns. Things like that. With that, let's get to the important part. The tactical verse of the day. Is if you win 100 gunfights and go to hell. What was it all for? What was the point? Maritime environments often are beautiful. Even the smelly marshes where I grew up at low tide when they just smell horrible because all the decaying matter, plant and animal. When the sun sets on the horizon, they transform into something beautiful. The sun rise on the east coast or the sun set on the west coast. Or the sound of rain hitting leaves in a forest. It is beautiful. You know why it's beautiful? Because God made it beautiful. Psalm 19. One of my favorite psalms. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows us his handiwork. God is the author of beauty. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created all these environments that you see. Whether it's the rainforest of Oregon or the rocky coast of Maine or some little backwater estuary in Florida. He created them. The author of beauty. But you know what? He created you in his very own image. It says that he created everything. But he only says about man that you were created in his very own image. You are made in the image of God, special and set apart from all creation. The author, the one who made beauty, made you in his own image. With that, gunfighters, until next time, be blessed.